or about the viticulture right away and then um yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> since you're not going to talk as if you are um so we are live and i will uh start blabbing here in one second um yeah let's just start uh, hello all who have joined us um uh, this is the Santa Rita Hills Wine Alliance's uh, fairly regular uh, Tuesday night affair. Uh, we've been doing these since last uh, summer. Uh, we've done quite a few of them now. We've featured more than 30 winemakers uh, on this during these pandemic times. Uh, my name is Matt Ketman, as you can see on your screen. Uh, I'm a senior editor at the Santa Barbara Independent and a experienced editor for Wine Enthusiasts, where I review a couple hundred wines a month. Um, including wines made by the lovely Karen Steinwalks here, joining us from, from Buttonwood Winery. Uh, today, we have an interesting combo of, of uh, discussion topics. We're obviously going to talk about wine and the Santa Rita Hills. Those are kind of the two givens here. Um, but we're also going to talk a little bit about um, kind of old-time ranching in, in the Lompoc area and a little bit of land conservation, too, um, because our other guest, who is on his way to sit with Karen, is, is Art Hibbets, uh, who is a longtime rancher from um, just, I guess it'd be just east of Lompoc. Uh, I think he was one of the co-founders of what became the Land Trust of Santa Barbara County, probably, you know, arguably the most important land conserving device in, in this region. Um, and he also has a vineyard on the property and Karen uh, has been privileged enough and probably honored to be making the wine from that property for a number of years now. So uh, I think we're gonna hear a lot from Art about his family history uh, when uh, when he gets here, but maybe we'll first start to talk with Karen uh, about um, about the wine she's making. And before we do that, let me just remind you that we have um, we kind of stacked a bunch of these in a row. So um, after next week, we have another one on March second. We have uh, Byron a Winery and Siduri Wines are both pouring for us, both Jackson family companies with different winemakers, different approaches to Pinot Noir and other things in the Santa Rita Hills. So that should be a fun one. Uh, March 16th, we have Foley Estates lined up, so we're going to taste through a good amount of what they have to offer these days. Uh, March 30th, uh, we have uh, Rio Vista Vineyard with um, the uh, Thorne family who owns the property, and, and they've made some wines um, in recent times that we're going to get to try. Probably we'll be some of the first people to try them. Um, and we're going to bring on a couple other guests who make wine from Rio Vista Vineyard. I actually made a barrel of wine. Well, I bought a finished barrel of wine from Rio Vista Vineyard back in 2013, maybe something like that. Maybe I should dig one of those up, we could try that. Um, and then on April 6th, uh, we're gonna have Matt Dees uh, and Ruben Solorzano from The Hilt, um, which is out there at Rancho Salsa Puedes, and they're gonna talk about um, that crazy ranch um, and the wines that are being made out there. So that's what we have to look forward to. Uh, but tonight, um, as we're awaiting the legendary Art Hibbets to show up in, in Karen's room there, um, Karen, tell us a little bit about a little bit about yourself. I think a lot of people know who you are, um, but if they don't, let us know a little bit about yourself, um, and then tell us, uh, you know, how you got involved with Hibbets Ranch. Um, and in the meantime, let's start with the Chardonnay. I should mention that we have three wines to taste tonight. One is the Hibbets Ranch Chardonnay from 2018. Um, the next one we will try would be the 2019 uh, Hibbets Ranch Vineyard. Santa Rita, or uh, Rosé of Pinot Gris. This is Karen's uh, own label, Sea Grape here. Um, she made that one in uh, what you'd call an orange style, um, but we can I'm actually really excited to talk about the, the Pinot Gris and, and why it's that pink color. Uh, and then uh, Buttonwood, um, under the Buttonwood label, Karen made um, a Hibbets Ranch Pinot, and the one we're tasting is from 2016. So I'm gonna pour some Chardonnay, Karen, and um, you tell us about uh, your history and, uh, and what you know about Hibbets Ranch. Sure. So, um, you many of you know that you know I dropped out of high tech and came up to um, Santa Barbara County in 2001 for just a couple months before I was going to go back and get uh, another real job and uh, started at um, what was then Foley uh, here in outside of Solvang with Norm Yost and uh, and I just never went back to the real world. So I worked at Foley for three vintages with Norm. And then I went to uh, work with Kathy Joseph over at Fiddlehead in the ghetto and the, you know, the fun days of the ghetto when it was all really production. 
Uh, and in 2007, the job um, here at Buttonwood became available for a winemaker because um, Mike Brown was taking, you know, I mean, he was doing so much with Calira after Sideways that uh, he just decided to focus on his own brand. And I had come to Buttonwood for years for some of the events because there's those, if those of you who don't know, there's this really lovely uh, area up in the vineyard by the pond that is um, truly a special serene place. And there is these cool events up there. There was a, there was a concerts every year with Rick Longoria, Red, White and Blues. And every other year there was this really delicious, amazing crawfish boil. And um, anyway, it's just a beautiful place. And what I liked about Buttonwood um, and still do is that it's not just uh, growing wine, but it's growing everything else for the table as well. So down where I am right now, outside of here is uh, peach and uh, orchards and um, our hop yard. And then the area we grow a lot of row crops. We also grow pomegranates and almonds are blooming right now, which are just spectacular. Um, so I like the fact that uh, Buttonwood was a farm that grew so much for the table. And when um, and I've always liked that you've told me that there are people that come to Buttonwood just for the wine and people that come just for the peaches. And sometimes like they don't even know the other one exists, essentially. Well, the pe people don't seem to like wine. Uh -huh. um, I mean, a lot. I mean, we have some heritage people that come for the peaches, I have to say, including <laughs> some um, at least a deck, you know, a triple digit nuns. Um, and those people, they just, they, they, you know, you try to say like, you know, in your best marketing thing, like, you know, and the Grenache Blanc goes really lovely with the peaches. Like, I don't like wine. <laughs> like, so, so there's peach people and there's wine people. And the wine people, of course, would love to have peaches. And of course, what we try to do, uh, and you know, Matt, because you've got kids, you try to keep the kids of the people out of the peach trees. And um, yeah. <laughs> so last year was interesting because we didn't open the peach stand at all. Uh, because of COVID, we donated the peaches to the food bank. And um, honestly, it was like not having to deal with people screeching into the parking lot because they might not get the very last peach was just kind of delightful. I mean, there's a there's a lot of kind of good things that came out of the pan pandemic. We like the reservation system a lot better than the belling up to the bar stuff. I'm not sure what we'll do about peaches and pomegranates and pears and things this year, but it was kind of nice not having to you know, be the um, peach police. Peach police, yeah. So, um, so I came here in 07, and uh, what we used to have, and Betty Williams was the founder, at, uh, who is the founder. She was still on earth at that time, and she wasn't really, um, she had lost her eyesight, so she wasn't really venturing out too much. But we have this, we used to have this uh, big event that Matt, you've been to, the All Farm Dinner, where everything on the table was grown or raised here. And um, Art Hibbets and his wife, Sherry, who has since passed away, came, came to that dinner and they went up to the house to see Betty and visit with her before the dinner. And then this big lumbering giant of a, a person came down and said to me, um, you know, Betty tells me that you like making Pinot Noir. And I'm like, I mean, it was a little bit of a dilemma, right? Because I, you know, obviously there's no Pinot Noir grown here in um, Los Olivos and I didn't know if I was trying to be tricked into a question. Or, so I said, well, yeah, but, you know, I think making Merlot is going to be just as much fun. And um, he said, oh, well, that, I, And that was right. That was your first, one of your first events at the winery, basically. Yes. yes. As an employee. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, I've got some Pinot. Do you want, you know, do you want it? And I'm like, where? And he said, you know, in Santa Rita Hills. And. And I'm like, w where? Because I knew all the vineyards out there, right? And I'm like, I don't know any vineyard out where he's talking about. So it was, I went out on Sunday, drove out there and drove into his house and um, drove past, I didn't know where to go, drove past his house. And as you drive past his house and past all the, the equipment uh, sheds, and so there's like, there's this area where everything grows. I mean, there's, I think there's bananas there. There's uh, there's everything, and I call it now the Garden of Eden. And there was two rows of uh, Pinot Noir grapes, and I thought, oh no! I mean, he obviously doesn't know how many <laughs> how many tons it takes to make wine, right? This is going to make like maybe a couple bottles of wine. So I'm like, I don't really know how to tell this lovely person that really this isn't 
a vineyard. And uh, he came out, he came lumbering out and he said, oh, so you, you've seen the test vineyard or whatever he calls it. And he goes, let's go up to the vineyard. I'm like, well, thank heavens for that. So <laughs> we go out the house across the road, you know, down one of the row crop fields because he leases a lot to uh, like Bobby Campbell and they grow, they grow lettuces and things there through another walnut orchard, you know, like up and around through another walnut, I think they call them, I don't know, walnut groves. I don't know what they call them. Um, not, not, tree, not tree place. Right. <laughs> finally on the very top of the hill, there is this very steep real vineyard. I mean, it's like a real vineyard, thank God. And um, I think I just finally saw him pull in. Um, Good. And it's got everything in there. So it's got Pinot, it's got Pinot Noir, and he can tell you how many clones and how many rootstocks. And then it's got Pinot Gris a little bit and Chardonnay. And he planted that with Michael Benedict. And I think it was, I think we started it in 2001. Um, and it was a test vineyard. So they were just kind of testing the waters to see what would grow there. And as because they're like the far, far western edge of the center it's of the very hill. Right? So if you look at the map, it's, it just, and it's tiny. It's only like three acres, I think. There's this little jut out right there. Uh, and that's it. So um, it's like every eight vines is different in the in the first part of the vineyard. So you go down and you've got like a Pinot Noir 667 on 101 14, and then you've got 777 on 110R, and then you've got you know, on and on and on of all these clone and rootstock combinations. And then in between the Pinot Noir, there is Pinot Gris. So you're like red, red, russet, and then more more Pinot. And then all of a sudden there's some Chardonnay. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of test are you guys trying to run out? <laughs> so it's like, I mean, it is by design a field blend vineyard. Um, uh, so we pick it, we have to pick it by, uh, I mean, I mean, every year we try to do this, like, you know, what, what are the different um, lab characters? Like, so we test, P, you know, pH uh, acidity and bricks on each one of these combinations. I get these little baggies of like, you know, stuff to test. And uh, finally you come down to it at the end, just like, you know, pick the first block and then pick the top and then pick the San Bernard Benedict own root at the bottom. And then, you know, then pick the Chardonnay and, um, and it makes a delicious wine uh, um, just by nature, I think of its field blend. And I mean, you can see the ocean from there. It's, and it's steep. Um, and you're the, are you, are you the only one that makes the wine from there? Or does he make any wine or what, what else happens no. with the fruit? So uh, we're the only ones that get the wine and uh, we are, you know, happy to do so. Um, most of it is Pinot Noir. I think I had from last year, 12 barrels Chardonnay, uh, not too much. I mean, unfortunately, because it's just delicious. A lot of that's Buente clone. Um, but we have a, you know, we like to call it a monopole on that vineyard. Um, and a lot of it is just, it's a little unusual, right? Because it's the only fruit that we have that is not growing here. Um, he, we're very much involved with him and, and growing it. And, you know, his son, Kevin, or Kevin, uh, Kevin? Uh, his son is like one of the head guys at Mesa Vineyard um, in uh, Paso. So there's a lot of expertise in farming and viticulture as well. But it is, uh, it's not easy. I mean, we had, um, and it's not fun soil. It's kind of adobe, uh, nasty So Art calls it cruddy soil. Um, so you've got to worry about uh, erosion. There he is. There's, I'm just hang on. I'm going to go like flag him down. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. okay. Oh, it's monologue time for Matt. That's be fun. <laughs> um, well, the Chardonnay is, is quite good. I actually uh, was introduced to these wines from Karen, obviously. Um, and I've been, I've never actually met Art. So I'm excited to, you know, meet him virtually now and hear about his own uh, family story and um, about this ranch and really to hear about how way back when he uh, he started the, the land trust for Santa Barbara County. I think it was called something first, then it evolved. And I think he did that with Betty Williams, who was the, you know, the founder of the Buttonwood Winery. So um, hopefully he's going to regale us with some, some fun uh, old uh, timey stories. Um, I actually just real I was looking up some information about him right before this. And uh, there's a recent video, uh, looks like it, at least it was posted recently, December 2020 on the Land Trust site. It's just a short kind of 45 second 
um, reel of, of art driving around and explaining, you know, why they chose uh, land conservation as a way to preserve the property um, when they were scared that, you know, the the sprawl of Lompoc was just going to kind of take over everything around there. So um, I've actually never been to the vineyard, but it would be fun to go check it out one time because it does sound like it's on the far western edge and and uh i literally I chase him down the street <laughs> he's what i had to chase him down the street okay <laughs> well i've been like monologuing for uh, <laughs> Sorry. 30 seconds but it felt like 10 minutes so, <laughs> um, so yeah so it's you can kind of see it if you're really looking for it so if you're going into lompoc from on 246 and you can see all of his hibis ranch walnut on the so you're, uh, you're coming down that road you put the lot Parisimo, you've already the mission you've already passed on your right is over to the you know off that other little road so you're kind of weaving around on the right is that big walnut grove and he's up to the left i assume in there correct yeah so that's his home ranch right there there he is come on in art and then across the street there's like row crops and then you see more walnut trees and then way up on the top of that is where the vineyard is okay great here he is <laughs> there he is Woo you have to wear a mask can we transmit the virus over the internet well you can't uh, i hope not <laughs> not that kind of virus <laughs> whatever's appropriate all right so we're talking about your vineyard and waiting for you to tell us about your vineyard and how it all began yeah and your and your ranch and your family history and, and all of the above so get yourself comfortable um karen tell us it's a little bit about the chardonnay as art's finding his seat and everything yeah we'll let art get his uh, palette primed here so uh we don't get an awful lot of chardonnay off of the property we wish there was more but uh we we um we try to make it in a style that's gonna to appeal to a lot of different um, tastes. So we do it one third each in stainless steel, once used French oak and neutral French oak. And uh, on the stainless steel, it doesn't go through any malolactic fermentation. On the other ones, we let it do as much as it wants, but we don't, uh, we don't inoculate for it, we don't inhibit it. And the idea is you get this really pretty, um, I mean, I really think that Santa Rita Hill should be known as much or more for Chardonnay as it is for Pinot Noir. Um, so this is a whole cluster pressed um, and we um, we inoculate it for primary fermentation and the rest of it just kind of makes itself. And then we make a blend of those three different things and we get this lovely Chardonnay that always has that really pretty Santa Rita Hills crispness. And, and I get like a little bit of, uh, you know, that kind of briny ocean character from it as well. Right. Which would make sense being that close to the ocean, if that's gonna, you know, make sense at all. So, great. Um, well, Art, why don't you uh, saddle up and um, tell us a little bit about your your history? I'm gonna I'm gonna start drinking the um, the Pinot Gris while we're while we're moving into Art here too. So, okay. Well, so, how are you doing, Art? Well, I'm good, Matt. I just don't know why my, my way around. I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to delay you, but. Uh, while we're on the subject of Chardonnay, we, uh, Michael Benedict was instrumental in getting me, you know, in, into putting this vineyard in. And he has always said that Lompoc would be the place to make Chardonnay and uh, in particular Champagne. And so we, at the time, Pinot was the hot item. You know, I think it was over 4,000, wasn't it? 4,500 a ton or some ridiculous price. And Chardonnay was half that. In fact, people were grafting Chardonnay to Pinot. But uh, I think Karen's absolutely right. That uh, does very well in our climate. It, uh, we have two clones. One is Michael Benedict's original one from Fuente. And uh, it's own rooted. And uh, it's the first thing to come out. And uh, very vigorous plants uh seems to if we prune it properly it's about three tons an acre on the average <laughs> you can figure that out <laughs> but, yeah. but i wish i wish i had more a lot more but in fact we're look 
we have about 40 acres that are ready to plant, but it just doesn't seem like the time to plant more grapes. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's always, it's always tough. And you, you've had some, uh, not to go on a tangent, but you've had some pretty massive vineyards pop up right around you there too. Um, sure. No, you but anyway, t tell us about, tell us about your family history, how long you guys have been in the area and, and, um, you know, how you, how you got even to know Michael Benedict. And, and I think you were, you knew Betty Williams way back when too. So. Well, that was all that seventies, late sixties and early seventies era. But, um, okay. Well, starting about the ranch, we got it, bought it in 1905. I think my grandfather came from the Midwest. My grandma was, was from Maine. And prior to that, it was owned by Hollisters and, uh, you know, before that was a Spanish land grant, I guess. And so you know, grapes have always been raised in Lump Oak Valley, especially at the mission. But you go to all the old ranches, you know, the, the Italians and the Portuguese both uh, all had their little vineyard there and made their own wine. And some of those vines are still alive, as you know. There's uh, in Sabata Canyon, there's still some old, very old wine. Gypsy Canyon? But yeah, they Gypsy, all, yeah. But they all do well. The biggest negative about Lump Oak is, you know, cool, damp weather is what uh, mildew loves. And so mildew is a continual battle. But uh, other than that, the pluses are that the grapes retain their acidity and their flavors in the cool climate, where over here in San Diego Valley, 100 degree days just smoke all that stuff. And, uh, right. you know, so we're looking, as you know, for a balance between acidity and and uh, bricks and. Uh, you and your know, family's always been uh, like historically over the century plus now has been kind of multi crop farmers. You always had a bunch of different things going on. Yeah, we just uh, like everybody else. Lompoc Valley used used to be uh, sheep and cattle, and then it became uh, various mustard and things around World War One. We put orchards in, in the, about the depression and other people put them in around the turn of the century, you know, but uh, we just, the main crop has been walnuts for the last probably, you know, 60 or 70 years. What's happening to the walnuts is with the warm climate, they aren't going to sleep and getting their, you know, they need to go dormant. And grapes are that way too, but they survive, I think, better than walnuts do. Walnuts need four to 700 hours of under 40 degrees. Grapes, I don't know. Well, they raise them in South Africa where there's no freezing weather. Right. I so know. I didn't realize, so walnuts are having a, like a bit of a climactic issue, right? Are they, are they not like fruiting as much then or whatever the right word is for them? Well, they just, they don't go dormant properly. They don't get the rest they need to rejuvenate, and they uh, they produce very erratic uh, crop. It would be like having grapes that bloom for three months. You know how that would work out. Mm -hmm. Thing we we have walnuts that are pushing out now, and uh, some of them didn't lose their leaves until December. So things are climate changes a real issue for deciduous trees of all types. And, uh, so speaking of walnuts for a moment, last year, it was pre-pandemic, so it was last last year, uh, we picked green walnuts. I was going to ask, have you ever tried <laughs> making that booze? <laughs> we made that mochino, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How is it? Uh, I haven't had it recently. It's pretty sweet. I think we made it a little too sweet, but... Um, well, because the risk is is risk is like can be too bitter. It can be bitter. It's it's a bitter essentially, right? And then you have to sweeten it up. Yeah. So we followed this rule, the Trinidadian recipe, and we made a mess out of Art's kitchen. Um, <laughs> and you know, walnuts, even the green ones, you just you you're stained for like you know. But it was a fun project. We were, you know, the trouble is you're you're also dealing with with brandy, right? Because it's a fortified thing, and you're. You're siphoning, so at the end, <laughs> but it was just a fun project. Right. We may do more of that, Matt. But back to yeah. what goes on in in uh, the, you know, the 
the grapes just really do well. We plant first block 201, and that had two clones of Chardonnay uh, on um, resistant rootstock, and uh, then about eight different clones of Pinot Noir and then Pinot Gris. And uh, I think we had two varieties of Pinot Gris, and Grigio, which is Great. gray it's gray yeah. and yours they're different okay. no they're not <laughs> just the <laughs> same but yeah did um what how'd you pick pinot you know, i mean obviously at this point chardonnay is a, is a you know at that time is a known entity pinot noir is an entity pinot gris falls in a similar category but how did you decide to pick pinot gris or to put pinot gris in um when it was time to plant the vineyard i think that was Probably Michael Benedict would say, why waste your time? He considers it a, you know, not a very flavorful wine. You know, I, I like Pinot Gris. So part of the planning was, you know, I like certain grapes. In fact, I, back when I was in high school, I planted Zinfandel. And uh, Lumpok is not Zinfandel <laughs> country. <laughs> so you planted Zinfandel when you're in high school it, on your property. Well, all of us kids, my dad gave each of us one acre to do whatever we wanted. And so it was actually uh, in that era, I planted table grapes and then later Zinfandel. And Did it get ripe? Oh, it was beautiful. Very nice taste. Uh, I don't have any winemaker to tell me that. <laughs> like, no, I was, we just love to go down there and eat the grapes, but we never made wine out of it. No, it's it's been an interesting thing, but uh, we also tried Viognier, which is I think Should people great. people can't pronounce it, so I guess they don't know what it is. If you know what do they call it, Wagner or something. <laughs> I don't know. Do you yeah. like Viognier? It uh, I think I I like Viognier when it's well made. It's I think it's pretty hard to make well because it's um, I get kind of two versions submitted to me. One is the more typical one is um, really ripe and kind of flabby and very just pe like super peachy flavors. Uh, and then and then you can do it the other way where it doesn't taste like anything too, you know? Which is actually how a lot of Pinot Grigio typically gets made is that it's made into something that's about a step above water, uh, you know, for the mass market because that's what that can sell a lot. Um, but anyway, yeah, but so Viognier can be a tough grape to do, but I think it does quite well in cooler climates well, because that inhibits good. that overly peachy thing. So, um, yeah, Pinot so, Gris looks handsome. Yeah. Um, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about this Pinot Gris, uh, Karen. I mean, Pinot Gris, Gris means gray for those who um, yeah, don't speak French. I don't really speak French, but I know that. Um, but it essentially makes a russet colored grape. Um, and then, you know, most people just press it off and it becomes a white wine and it's, it's, it can be good as a white wine. It can be boring as a white wine, but Karen, you've decided to make a rosé out of it. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, so we used to make Pinot Gris, uh, from Arts Graves here at Buttonwood and, um, the sales department here is continually telling me to just stop right because i i mean at button what do we make about I, I think there's over two dozen different bottlings because what well i keep saying like well what if we do this and what if we do that and if you know if they turn out fun then you know we bottle them like you know car carbonic franc and this year carbonic malbec and pet nat and anyway it was getting a little out of control for inventory purposes so it doesn't sound like it's gotten more under control you just you just <laughs> changed it <laughs> Um, yeah, well, the wine club is like, they're like a big focus group, right? So yeah. anyway, I uh, probably you know, underhandedly decided that I would abscond with the Pinot Gris from Hibbets for a sea grape. And the first year I made it, I did a little bit of skin contact and it, it really kind of gave it a really nice viscous textural property to it. And I, I liked it, but I was expecting it to have a little bit of color and it didn't, it was white. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's with that? So the next year I made it, um, which is this year, I decided to just give it a, a day in the cold room on skins. And honestly, it, it was like a red wine. It was like crazy. Uh, and then happily, you know, some of that fell out. So 
the way that um, I make this, and um, I, I tend to do a little goofier things with sea grape than I would do with buttonwood because, you know, if I really screw it up under sea grape, it's like, it's just on me, but I don't certainly want to screw things up too much for, for the owners of buttonwood. So um, I, I just like to make this on a skin. So all of those rustic colored grapes, like Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer, They've, there's something about the skins of those uh, gray grapes, which is such a weird word to call them, that they are so flavorful. I mean, you just want to eat them. I mean, there is so much flavor in the skins, and it always seems shameful to me to, you know, not take advantage of trying to extract all of that. So this is, a, it's, and it was a little bit of a dilemma because usually you think of a rosé as being made from red grapes, right? So you take red grapes and you press them and you don't leave them on skins very long. And that's how you take, like we make a Grenache and a Syrah here at Buttonwood. You don't leave them on skins very long so that you get a rosé from red grapes. And then I did the opposite. I took, you know, white grapes and I left them on their skin. So it's not really a rosé. And I didn't know, I didn't know what to call it because I'm like, well, I've always said that a rosé is made from red grapes and this isn't really a red grape and on and on and on. So. I, I was like, I don't know what to call it. It's really pink. It's really delicious. Um, and um, I have a good friend Tom, who's a winemaker now in Michigan, Thomas Hausman. He was a winemaker at Anami up in Oregon for many years. And he makes a, a, he makes a skin contact Pinot Gris and he calls it Rosé of Pinot Gris. Well, I figured he must have already put it through TTB and didn't get rejected. So I'll try that. So it's not really a Rosé. And then the other problem is like calling it an orange wine gives you, uh, well, you know, Matt, you can't really say that because some orange wines are just funky, right? I mean, they're just, yeah. um, they're just like, you know, you, you they're just sour. And, yeah. So yeah. This is, uh, it's like, it's, I don't know what to call it wine, but um, it's delicious. I think it works. I mean, I think it functions as a rosé, right? I mean, it, 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 it has rosé kind of character. It's delicious. Uh, I think it's cool. Um, I, I don't understand. I've had, you know, I've had yours like this. I think I've had one or two others that have a slight pink to them. And then I've had Pinot Gris that just have extended skin contact. It doesn't always show up in the color, but you can tell it in the, in the flavor and in the viscosity. And they're just so much more interesting than, than the, those just completely pressed off, very clear uh, Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigios. I don't understand why anyone does it that way other than there's a large segment of the wine drinking public that maybe doesn't even like the flavor of wine that much. They just want some crisp tasting alcohol. And so maybe that's well, what drives I mean, it. Sarah and Margarita Pinot Grigio really set that mark, right? Yeah, and right, yeah. I love them for what they did because at least they introduced some people that may have been drinking something else to wine. But mm -hmm. um, this year, uh, the wine that I have in barrel for 2020, I decided to really be really geeky and it really didn't work. So I was gonna, I was gonna start it all on skins and I was going to take half of it off and not have it pink and then half of it on so that I would have half of the bottling is white and half of it is pink. And so that was going to be my cool, like geeky thing I was going to do with it this year. And by the time I just like one day, one day I went to pull this off and it was already pink. I mean like fuchsia pink. So there is no white possible to it. Did you, just blend, did you just blend them to the about them together or because yeah, I went to pull it off for the white and I'm like it's already pink. So I mean yeah. so there isn't any white. Um and I found last year with an awful lot of grapes that there was so much extraction from the skins, um, on color particularly that you know, so maybe I'll try it again next year. But um I don't know, it's it's like it's hard to describe, but um right. I like it. Oh, we all <laughs> I like it. it. You like it, Art? Absolutely, Matt. You know, you've heard the old thing about how you determine which wine is, you know, what people like. You put this out and some Syrah Rosé and Grenache Rosé and some Pinot and some Chardonnay. You'll figure out what people like in a hurry. You pick <laughs> which bottle you run out of, you know. This stuff doesn't last at my house. Uh, the old Pinot Gris and this. It just doesn't last. And those new Syrahs are, to me, those are wonderful summer wines. They go with all kinds of food. You know, I just, uh, and plus they're a little lower alcohol content. And right. 
and a lot of people are looking for that too. So right, right. So Art, tell us a little bit about. Um, I mean, I think I want to know a little bit about the start of of, the, of what became the land trust and what made you do that and why you decided to preserve your ranch in the way you've you've done that. Well, as long as I can remember, clear back when I was high school, city of Lompoc just wanted to keep expanding. And in those days, that was before environmental impact reports and stuff. You know, it was pretty much cities just took farm ground as needed. You know, it was the city was considered in control. Well, my dad fought that. And so when Vandenberg, remember Camp Cook closed down and there was a period where there was nothing. And then Vandenberg came in and south was Navy and north was Air Force, or north end. And, so the growth, they were going to build the whole Lompoc Valley to the ocean, solid houses. They were, they were hauling the lumber in to do this. In our side of the city, on the east side, it was all planned for a golf course and five, half acre, one acre, and five and ten acre parcels where we exist. And we, we fought that. Anyway, the long story short, the boom crashed. And the McHenry family that owns where this vineyard is, they'd had it for a hundred years. They got the land back and eventually we leased it and we bought it. And that's where our vineyard is. But it's been a, it's still going on today. They want to annex from the city out to Bailey Avenue and other hundreds of prime class one irrigated row crop ground. And that's what not where our vineyard is, but that's where I live is some of the best ground in the world. By the way, I ought to tell you a great story about Karen. Down there where I planned my stuff in high school, she calls it the Garden of Eden because the grapes are, you know, the grapes on class one irrigated, you know, the very best ground. They just go crazy. You know, it's just one year the shoots are <laughs> this big around, you know what I'm saying? And they if they get, have too much vigor, and I don't think they have the flavor. But if yeah. I have one plant of peanut, of one plant, about a dozen plants on peanut, peanut on freedom rootstock, I got 10 tons per acre of peanut. No, <laughs> Karen didn't want that. <laughs> a little water, a little watery, a little, <laughs> yeah. No. Good for no, jam. No, grapes, yeah. really, grapes really do like uh, the the hills and the little weaker soil, don't you think? The cruddy soil, you'll call it. Yeah, why, why haven't you planted grapes down here, right? Same, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So how well, did you, how you, how you mentioned you the whole land trust thing? Yeah. Well, so the, Betty got tired of fighting the same battles, and we were doing the revising Santa Barbara General Plan, and Betty was involved in the advisory committee here in San Inez, and at that time I lived in San Inez. And those meetings were so contentious and they were talking about limiting growth and so forth. And finally, Betty just got fed up and she decided she's going to do something positive rather than having these horrendous knockdown drag out meetings. You know how land use is. It's very contentious. And so she did the research and found about conservation easements that were working back east and also in the mid uh, Montana and stuff. And uh, so she founded the San Inez Land Trust and I was on the board of directors. And that was at the same time she was dealing with Michael and putting, putting in the grapes and Michael saying, I'm not gonna go to hearings, you know, I'm trying to do something positive. So that worked well with Betty. And so they, I guess they formed a nursery, right? It was a nursery here, yeah. It was all own rooted nursery. For Sanford and Benedict. And right, yeah. From those varieties that uh, he had out there, he had a he had a wide variety of things there too. The mm -hmm. There was Cabernet and Riesling growing here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that was Buttonwood, the first property that was put into a conservation easement, or no, Buttonwood was not. Buttonwood did not, but uh, there were there was one out by uh, Kachuma, I can't remember the name, it was one of the first ones, a, a huge ranch on the North Shore of Kachuma. I think we, uh, there were quite a few of them by the time we, we did ours, but 
It was and when did, when did you do yours, Art? I don't even remember the date now, but it was, uh, we were the first, no, the second ranch to go in the Ag Preserve program when that was, you know, first available. And then once the conservation easement, it took years to get the grants and get everything lined up. And that was when Michael Feeney was the land trust and by then uh, Sandy Inez Land Trust combined with Carpenteria Land Trust and so the land trust for Santa Barbara County. And they continue to expand, but uh, it, it's been a long time and it's been the best thing we could possibly do because uh, you're, you know, you know, a conservation easement is in perpetuity. You know, so that, that means that what, so your, your land stays in agriculture, right? The nice thing about a conservation easement, the owner decides what they want the use to be. You can say it's only going to be used for grapes or it's only going to be used for orchards or there's only going to be no more houses, period. It's never going to be used for shopping centers. You know, you can lay out a plan that meets your thing. Like mine, I, I put a condition, no hoop houses because hoop houses uh, are considered to be fairly unattractive. <laughs> so... Anyway, it's been a, a great experience. And if you know any of those land trust people, they're uh, very dedicated and they're doing great things. And, uh, yeah, no, and it's become a, a critical tool, not just here locally, but it's been very critical locally, but but across the, the country and, um, you know, in protecting landscapes that matter in the ways that their owners would like to, rather than it being forced upon people, so. Um, yeah. Well, as I say, it's between you and the land trust, not you and the government. The government right. will never let you develop the land, but the government is not calling the shots. It's you and the land trust. So they can't put it into eminent domain once it's in the trust? They couldn't do that? But the land trust would probably fight it, Okay. Yeah. whether they would win or not, but it's their job to protect the conservation easement. Yeah. And I think here it's, it's a, that'd be a bad look too for I think a government to try to go up against a conservation yeah. it wouldn't stop them necessarily, but and I think what they did well. here in the valley was um, she was worried here in the valley as far as I remember talking to her about it that everything was going to turn into a five acre ranchette and Buttonwood is a hundred and seven acres, so most of the ones you know between the Solvang city limit and my little place down in uh, Los Olivos, uh, so from here to the Herthels are large parcels and they're not the five acre ranchette. So that kind of starts at, at my house in Los Olivos, uh, but between the city limits of Solvay and there, these are still, um, I mean, we're here, the Carhartts are here, Rideau is here, and those are not gonna be carved up into five acre parcels. And she, no, they're and she working functional. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the Pinot. Um, Art, uh, before you joined us, Karen was telling us about how many different um, <laughs> clones and rootstocks and everything you planted. Um, so what was the, were you guys just trying to test things out? Were you just trying to have a good time? Or were you trying to make what becomes you know, pretty classic uh, cuvee that, that, that Karen is making for you now? Well, that's, that's a long story, but Talk, as you know, what are there about a hundred different clones of Pinot? And uh, probably, the, yeah. the French ones all have numbers, and then the other countries have different designations. But I don't know how many we have. I looked through the <laughs> folder, but the first go around, I think we planted five. But we've got now, I, I think I can remember them all. We've got uh, 04, <laughs> you know, 04. Pomard. Pomard. Uh -huh. four. And then there's Pomard five. Well, yeah, there's one fourteen, one fifteen, triple thirteen, triple six seven. Triple uh, six. Uh, or six six seven. Eight to eight. Yeah. Sanford and Benedict. Yeah, S and B. So so of course Michael Benedict was very kind. Uh, his foreman they had very specific vines. And at that point, those vines were, let's see, those vines are almost 30 years old, but they really liked Michael for flavor and production and so forth. And they were a 
they were not trellis, they were California sprawl, you know, just big, huge vines. Anyway, so I got from their favorite plants, I got these cuttings and they, Michael told me, I think they came originally, his source was Wente, but I'm not sure about that. I think anyway. he told me that before as well. And then Wente, they think came from the Paul Masson stuff. Uh, right. well, it was in Santa Cruz Mountains and yeah. Well, anyway, Michael had a lot of influence with, about those. I mean, and the other thing was what was available at the nursery because it was such a hot item. You know, my son has worked for Mesa Vineyard Management and so he had contacts with Sunridge. And remember they were doing those uh, things where you had a Uber bunnies. big yeah. tall container with a, when you put those in the ground, they were already one year ahead, you know, basically. Anyway, long story short, we we set it up like you would at any experiment uh, it would be described as a four four by five Latin square design where you have 10 plants and then you switch to a different cone and then 10 plants and you go through the five that you're doing and then, then you go backwards. And you, so you have from the top of the mountain to the bottom, the rows are north, south. You have all the soil differences. The tops of the mountains are the thinnest soil and all the good stuff's down at the bottom. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so you're trying to put the clones on all the different soil types you have. And of course they're subjected to the same weather pattern. So then what we did, we measured, well, let me tell you one thing we found out right away the deer didn't seem to have any preference for one or another. One. <laughs> they ate them all. <laughs> I'm sure that's great. I, don't, I mean, it does, the way you describe it, it does sound like a Michael Benedict experiment. I mean, he's a very scientific man. It's, it's He you know, pulled out all the potential variables, you know. Well, so he's trying to, it would have been better if we had more acres, but that's what we did. And the idea was to measure vigor uh, when, when bud break occurs, when you harvest, and then the chemistry. And Carrot did all the chemistry from day one. And I remember, you know, all these bags labeled with all these different clones. It's like a drug dealer coming in with all these little bags. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was a pain in the neck, but we were looking at uh, TAs, pH, and brick primarily, mm -hmm, TA. and flavor. Yeah. And Did you find, I mean, obviously the end result becomes a big, um, very complex cuvee now, which is awesome. But did you find, um, did you find answers to your questions? I mean, were there combinations that seemed to thrive more than others? I don't think we've ever been able to do it in a large enough experiment to say that. I mean, because, you know, we, we pick the, you know, these small amounts and we do the chemistry on them to see that. I mean, what, uh, what we've ended up doing over the past, wow, we've been making wine together for like 13 years now. Oh, you had 209 I got from the library. 07 was the first year. Yeah, I think you had six or seven. Yeah. So um, we've ended up like, we, we know what happens, like the stuff on the bottom obviously gets the water and uh, has more vigor. So uh, the 777 on the bottom is the last thing we pick. Uh, we try to keep these separate as we get the lots in as far as so we can do some barrel tasting. But, you know, there's really a triple seven. Probably we, we probably have a barrel of that by itself and probably Sanford and Benedict own rooted by itself. But the rest of them, you just there's just no way unless you had a bunch of half barrels. But um, they're just they, you know, they just develop differently. They're they're all pretty delicious. And we just. You know, we pick like 2001 first, and then we pick the top of 2005, and then. But it is one of the um, it is one of the earliest picking vineyards in Santa Rita Hills, which is you know, we beat Michael Benedict by at least a week a lot of times. Uh, huh? And the one, the lavender oak one that he, or you mean San Fernando Benedict? His original. Yeah, original. and you guys are on the far western edge, so you would think that it would take he forever. Worked. to, you know. Yeah, well, no, it, you know, on the average, if you compare temperatures here at that button, it was 10 to 15 degrees warmer on the average. You know, we're cool climate now. 
Last couple of years, I don't know what to say. <laughs> we, we had a bunch of 104 degree days. It wasn't 120 like it was here. <laughs> when I was cooking hot dogs. Yeah, I remember that day. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, so the hottest day of the year, Matt was here. We were doing our, trying to do our, our redo. Frank and Franks. Front, uh, Cabernet Franc and okay. Frankfurters. Yeah. And Matt was on the grill, on the big buttonwood buoy grill, like, it really wasn't fair. I really owe you for that. Wedding. <laughs> it was fun, though. It's a good story, which is almost worth doing anything for. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, Matt, because of the small uh, tonnages of each of these clones, uh, Karen and I decided early on we're just going to call it a field field blend, right? Yeah. Well, kind yeah. of. So yeah. what we do? Um, well, and there's a couple different stories there too, because there the Garden of Eden does come in. So I do get grapes from there and I always forget about it. And they show up in about 15 five gallon buckets in the back of Art's truck. Nice. <laughs> and about three weeks after everything else yeah. has been picked. Just what we think we're like down with Pinot, just like the, the bucket brigade shows up. So what we did last year was we did we took those and we made a, a, a pet net, which was nice. kind of fun. So uh, we didn't we didn't catch it exactly at the right spot, so it's not as effervescent as it should be, but uh, that was kind of a fun thing. But what we've decided to do is like all of these um, all these different lots, and you probably bring us like five or six deliveries over a couple of weeks usually uh, before the, like, the Pinot Gris comes first, and then all the Pinot Noir like over two or three weeks, and then the Chardonnay is usually the last thing. Um, and we love the fact that the stems get ripe enough. So about 20% of each lot is whole cluster. And we just we just estimate what that is on tonnage. And we put those whole clusters in the bottom of the fermenter. And then we just stem into the top of them. So about 20% of whole cluster um, um, stem inclusion. And uh, we've tried, we're doing some experiments with different yeast. So we if we have enough, so we can do a controlled experiment, we do that. We're finding uh, there's a, we use a Barolo yeast on these ones um, rather than a lot of my winemaker friends in Pinot Noir use this one called RC212. We like Barolo yeast, which is unusual, but Nebbiolo is you know, somewhat akin uh, to a cool climate Pinot. And, uh, and then we put it into about, uh, depending on the year and economics, about 15% to 20% of new French oak to um, you know, to age there. And we use, uh, we use some cool climate barrel from uh, Boswell, which just doesn't give you a lot of uh, toasty oaky flavor, but it gives you a, a really pretty kind of vanillin texture really thing to it. And then this one is a, a selection of barrels. So the Hibbets Ranch one um, is a favorite barrels we have in that particular year. And then we also make one, uh, which is Santa Rita Hills, which is not not the not favorite barrels, but the you know <laughs> the ones that don't go into the Hibbets range. Yeah, so these are our favorite barrels. Right, and Art, it sounds like you have more land that you, in the right economic climate, you would consider planting to grapes. Yeah, you know, we had somebody assess the the slopes and so forth. They go down now. I, we're talking about stuff much more you know more slopes, but. I think that's Raja's vineyard, isn't it? Oh, oh no, that's um there's a like a prisoner vineyard out there or something. Uh, yeah. Dave Finney. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Finney, yeah. 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 So anyway, our ranch is right north of that. There's uh, similar soils and so forth. And out of a hundred acres, he figured about forty was something he would recommend planting with that. And did you did I hear you saying that you were you're interested in cool climate Syrah these days? Because that's one of my favorite. Favorite grapes, but you were mentioning lower alcohol Syrah. Was that what you were talking about? Well, the the Syrah rosés are what I'm talking about. No, you're talking about the rosés, yeah. But, no, I've always liked cool climate Syrah, and you know yeah, it may not pepper. like we joke about the way things are going. You know, we'll probably be raising Zinfandel and Syrah and Cap <laughs> and Mumble before you know. <laughs> you go back to your high school days to resurrect that uh, vine and Zinfandel. <laughs> Anyway. Well, I'm not sure that all of that new vineyard is in the Appalachian, though, because isn't the Appalachian also based on elevation? Yeah, no, he had a fair amount, like 
on the flat. Like the garden of Eden, it's, yeah. uh, the elevation, uh, the Appalachian ends at 200 feet elevation on the west there, uh, kind of an arbitrary number. So most of that is up in the hills, but the stuff on the west is just like, yeah, it won't be in. It's not in. It'll be in Santa Barbara County. And yeah. then the other interesting, Matt, you won't believe there's um, the land that was too steep for grace. They went ahead and con uh, made it into beds and planted avocado. Huh. Have you ever seen avocados planted on beds? I mean, no. About 12 foot apart, and the beds are about six foot high. Can you imagine how much dirt had to be moved around to make those beds? And uh, they're just planting the avocados now. I I get an avocado crop about once every three years at my house due to frost. But of course, I'm lower elevation. These are on steep slopes, so maybe all the cold air will go somewhere else. But isn't that amazing? That's an interesting choice, yeah. Especially when you see so many people and uh, planting citrus. Uh, like up in the Edna Valley and around there, which must be a pretty similar climate to what you're dealing with. And I know citrus gets a lot of money right now. Um, you know, in my lifetime, how many times have you seen citrus orchards pulled out and then you know, <laughs> 10 years later? <laughs> I'm not into that. Maybe Ava is a safer, safer bet or something. I don't know. I'd rather Ava is my store than the other crop in Santa Rita Hills. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> By the way, we enjoyed your article. It was very interesting and informative uh, about cannabis. How uh, about the uh, the guy, Pelé? Yeah. yeah. I can't even remember his name, but yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just like everything else, Matt. Uh, there's Excess profits, this is what my banker says, excess profits breeds ruinous competition. And how long do you think it's going to be before that hits the, if it ha hasn't already? I mean, they, they just find this stuff everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I haven't understood the whole growth plan for for the cannabis market in California, but um, I don't know. We don't have to worry about that at the moment. Well, some of you actually have to worry about it quite a bit, but. <laughs> well, you know, we don't have to worry about it here in San Inez and Art doesn't have anybody on the west side of it. So it's just, you know, those worry that have uh, grows on the western side of their vineyards, which is really kind of the Oh, of course, concern. Guys in San Rosa Road. I mean, you drive out there yeah. when you turn off a 101 and that's something else. <laughs> yeah. But, Speaking of proof houses, yeah. 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 So Art's also a really big fisherman, and every year he goes to Alaska fishing and uh, halibut, salmon. <laughs> what about the Chardonnay? I guess we could do a halibut and butter. Oh, Chardonnay goes with everything. Was, oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, and you know Steve Escobar. He, he's right uh, here. He's right yeah. here. He's uh, the best thing I know with the uh, any of those wines is lobster, <laughs> you know. <laughs> fresh, yeah. caught, fresh caught lobster goes with just about anything we're talking about. Here. Yes. Yeah. It does. Well, this has been a uh, great conversation. I, I, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm sorry it's in this way, Art, rather than actually in person, but um, I wanted to hear your story for a long time. Karen has been a big proponent of what you've done um, for the Valley as a whole, and then also for um, your own ranch. And, um, you know, I think these wines speak for themselves. Um, the Pinot is great, the Chardonnay is great, and I, and I still am like probably most fascinated by the Pinot Gris, uh, which is you know a really cool project, and uh, I like to you know follow it and see how it goes into the future. So um, I think uh, people have enjoyed our conversation based on the comments. It seems like um, there was a question from Bob Dickey about a rosé about our rosé conversation. He was asking about Chris Kern. Chris does a Grenache Gris that she yeah. makes into a rosé um, because she couldn't, they wouldn't let her call it Grenache Gris because uh, the, the, the government hadn't filed that name yet. So she had to call it rosé of Grenache Gris. Um, but in any case, um, thank you so much for uh, joining us, everybody out there. Uh, thank you, Karen, as always, for um, shepherding us through this and providing some delicious wines. And thank you, Art, for um, you know sharing your knowledge and your 
insight about the valley and for um, you know doing what you have done for the valley and, and preserving not just the valley but the whole Santa Barbara County what you've been involved with I think it's gonna uh, be very important for decades and generations to come so cheers to that and thank you for that book you and McDuff it's gorgeous and it's a it's a testament to what we try to do here and you all captured yes. both the words and the visuals absolutely so perfectly so well thank you Karen yeah. Matt, yeah. under the circumstances, this is a time for a toast. Yeah. Everybody's toast. good health yeah. and the better times ahead. Okay. Yes. Our so. Hey, I got my second shot and I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Anyway, thank All right, you. Cheers. Right. cheers to you guys. Cheers to everyone watching. Um, and tune in next week. We got a bunch more coming up. So. Um,